Everybody open your Bibles to Romans chapter 12. (laughs) Fasten up. So Romans chapter 12. This is read this is read from the NLT version. And so dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind that he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Because of the privilege and authority God has given me, I give each of you this warning. Don't think that you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith that God has given us. Just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body, and we all belong to each other. In his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, then serve them well. If you are a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it is giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take that responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, then do it gladly. Do not just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in our confident hope Be patient in trouble and keep on praying when God's people are in need. Be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. Don't think that you know it all. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see that you are honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God, for the scriptures say, I will take revenge. I will pay them back, says the Lord. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you'll heap burning coals of shame on their heads. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. I would encourage you to commit that series of verses to mind and to heart. Last week, we began talking about what is a godly family. In order to talk about what is a godly family, we had to break down the parts of what a godly family is because the world has a different idea of what a godly family is. In most cases, the world tries to break apart the pieces of what a godly family really is. I should already be on. Uh, Jacqueline, can you throw last week's one up there? So the world has an idea of what a god, godly, or has an idea of what a family is anyway. But God has a much bigger picture, as I talked about last week. God's picture of what a family is includes multiple communities. So in this church, we refer to these communities as crib. So that refers to the covenantal community, the relational community, the infinite community, and the biological community. In most cases, we think that biology is the only community. Another way to say that would be the uh, nuclear family is the only community. That's not how God has it. Also, God has the family centered around the father with the power of authority coming from himself. So this is what makes a family different 
Well, it's one of the factors that makes family different. And we are going to be talking about that next week when we have Friends and Family Day. So I hope you all remember to show up and to bring people. But we'll be talking about that next week when we have Friends and Family Day, more along the lines of what really does make a godly family different. Today, after setting the groundwork and talking about the different parts of the family, what I want to talk about is how do these parts of a godly family interact with each other? How are they supposed to interact? So, of course, to talk about how we deal with family interaction, we first have to talk about how people should interact with each other in general. And, of course, we always assume that people don't have a frame of reference. So we go with the world's frame of reference to start with. That is not the correct one. That one will work. Go back. There you go. That one will work. Okay. <clears throat> so, to talk about family interaction, we want to talk about how the world sees family interaction. So, the world sees family interaction through the lens of what we call social contract theory. And we talked about that last week. I'll give you a quick definition of it. It's this. The voluntary agreement among individuals by which, according to any of various theories, as of Hobbes, Locke, and Rousseau, those of you who are Lost fans from a long time ago, that, that like, came out a long time ago, if you recall, Rousseau, Hobbes, Locke, all characters on Lost, because it had to do with building a society. Anyway, um, <clears throat> they organize society, is brought into being and invested with the right to secure mutual protection and welfare or to regulate the relations amongst its members. So in other words, we have the world telling us that the way a society interacts is specifically in order to secure mutual benefit. But of course, only to the point that that mutual benefit occurs. So you scratch my back, I scratch yours. If you draw a little blood by accident, you get a little too happy scratching, then I'm going to kill you and move on. Now God, of course, explains it a little different, right? God doesn't believe in social contract theory. God doesn't want us to believe in social contract theory. So the way God points it out um, is in multiple ways. We have Jesus himself explaining it in this way in Matthew 7.12. He says, anybody want to take a guess? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. This is called the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It's a little bit different than use others for my purposes until they no longer serve my purpose. Now Romans 12 expands on that even more. Romans 12 is what I read to you. So I'm going to break down Romans 12 and talk about that a little more. Verse 3 says, don't think you are better than you are. Verse 4 says, everyone has a special place, and that is with each other. Verse 5 says, we all belong to each other. 6 through 8, use your specialness to benefit all and do it well. Verse 9, really love people. The root word for love there in the Greek is agape, which means unconditionally. So really love people in an unconditional way. <clears throat> in other words, even if they draw a little blood, you don't kick them to the curb because you unconditionally love them. Don't just pretend, it says. Have genuine affection for each other. The, word, the root word there for affection is phileo, which is brotherly love. But let me define it more for you. It means loving affection or prone to love or loving tenderly. Loving tenderly. I might call that liking. Liking someone to the point where you view them as a brother. <clears throat> so have genuine affection. Work hard. Show your joy in troubles. Be patient and prayerful. Be eager. Be hospitable. Do not take revenge. Be openly honorable. You know how people secretly respect people sometimes, but they don't want to tell them that to their face? Be openly honorable. Do what you can to live in peace with everyone, not just the people you like. Give your enemies what they need. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. This instruction is not specific to the nuclear family. This instruction is specific to all people. 
and specifically even more to all Christians. Moses, of course, already gave this instruction in simplified format in Exodus chapter 20, when God described his thoughts on this subject of how a society should function in a theocracy to the Jewish people. So in Exodus 20, it says, Then God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt, out of the houses of slavery, and you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on their children, on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the Lord, your God, his name in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Six days you should labor and do all of your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath for the Lord your God, and in it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male, your female, your servant, your cattle, your sojourner, who even stays with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. And therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and mother, that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. You should not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. You may say, how is this connected to Romans 12? Well, it is connected to Romans 12. It's the Old Testament version of Romans 12. So... Let me clarify that for you the way that Jesus would clarify that for you. See, it's a bunch of laws, right? It's a bunch of different ways that we can interact in society. And when the Pharisees, who were the teachers of the law of that time, came across Jesus, they were jealous of Jesus. They didn't like Jesus because Jesus had a way of doing things that sort of upended their normal system. So the Pharisees asked Jesus, because they were trying to trap him, which of these laws is the most important law to follow? And of course, Jesus, in Matthew 22, 34 through 40, explains it something like this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like this. Love your neighbor as yourself. So when we go and we look back at Romans 12 and we talk about having a certain attitude toward people, loving them kindly, working hard, being tender-hearted, being affectionate, so on and so forth, we're talking about this portion, love your neighbor as yourself, which is connected to the last half of the Ten Commandments. How is it all connected? Moses was given these laws in order to give society order. The basic testing ground for society, even in evolutionary social thought, is what? The family. The family is the basic testing ground for society. Therefore, these two laws are the way that a family or a small society should act toward each other. And therefore, Romans 12, which further expands upon these through a Christ filter, not an Old Testament filter, but through a Christ filter, applies not just to societies, not just to Christians, not just to churches, but also to individual families. In other words, what I'm saying is, even though we don't like this, when I talk about how we're supposed to interact as families... What are the rules for that in Scripture? There's no special rules for family. Let me say that again. There are no special rules for a godly family. There's only special rules for a godly people. 
Therefore, our families and our churches and our societies are all subject to the same standard before God. All communities in God's understanding of his human creation are equally responsible, every one of them, equally responsible to teach each other a specific way. And this is why Jesus' followers often couple the nuclear family with other communities when they're speaking about responsibilities to treat each other a specific way. So let me just state that again. All of these communities, the covenantal community, the relational community, like your friends, your biological community, and of course, God and his community amongst himself, all of these are responsible to show how to behave godly to this little, little guy right there. So this is why Jesus' followers, when they write these, these letters, they constantly connect being a godly family with all these other different communities. Consider 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 5, 21 through 31. And further submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. For, or one could say, therefore, or because, for this means for wives that they need to submit to their husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of his wife, as we talked about last week. He is the savior of his body, and so on and so forth. What do you think it's connecting there? It's connecting the biological community with the infinite community. Ephesians 6, 1 through 9. Children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord, for this is the right thing to do. Honor your father and mother. This is the right thing to do. That's a moral premise, right? Fathers, this is my favorite part of that. You'll hear fathers oftentimes say, the Bible says to the children, the Bible says, honor your fathers and mothers. But they oftentimes don't tell you that just a couple verses later it says, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way that you treat them. Rather, bring them up with discipline and instruction from the Lord. Again, what do we see? We see family connected with infinite community. It goes on to say that slaves, yep, it goes on to say that slaves should obey their masters, that they should treat them with deep respect. Sounds a lot like the language in Romans 12. What are we connecting there? Well, it depends on how you look at it. Slaves weren't necessarily friends, although Roman's versions of slaves was different than what we had in America or Britain, but they would be sort of more on the covenantal side, maybe kind of both. But they were connected with what? The infinite community, again. We look at Colossians. Again, we have this. Wives, submit to your husbands. Children, submit. Slaves, submit. We look at Romans 13. People, submit to your government as to the Lord. We have this continual process of the scriptures pointing out, the followers of Jesus pointing out, that when you submit to God, you submit to man also. It's part of the submission structure. And when you're submitting to the, the, the institutions that man lays out, whether it be the nuclear family, or whether it be the government, or whatever, and you're doing this in a way where you're doing it joyfully, when you're looking out for the best interests of the person who's directly above you, then this is a good thing. This is what God wants you to do. So you might say to me at that point, well, how does that work? Like, are you really saying to me that we're supposed to treat sort of the uh, <clears throat> problem systems that man makes as something that we're supposed to submit to, something that we're supposed to be tender-hearted toward. Uh, a good example is, um, I was reading an article about SNL. Who's familiar with SNL? Saturday Night Live. Okay, so Saturday Night Live, been on for a long time. And they're always doing political commentary. That's sort of their shtick, right? So there was a guy in the 90s, his name's Dana Carvey, and he did an impression of 
George Bush. And then you have what's going on now with Alec Baldwin doing an impression of Donald Trump. And a lot of the people from the 90s are saying that they don't appreciate what's going on on Saturday Night Live right now because you can tell that the impression from Alec Baldwin is mean. Alec Baldwin has said multiple times that he hates Donald Trump. His impression is meant to slander him and to be mean. Whereas with Dana Carvey, you never knew. You didn't know whether he liked George Bush or not. Well, this is sort of the dichotomy that's being presented here, where our responsibility as Christians is to submit in a way where we want what's best. We're not mean to the people that we submit to. I shouldn't be mean to my parents just because I don't like their policies. I shouldn't be mean to my government just because I don't like its policies. This extends all the way down and it extends to all levels of society. We have an entire book of scripture that is written. When I say entire book, it's one of the shortest books in the Bible. But Philemon, we have a book of scripture that is written specifically but where Paul is addressing the relationship between a slave owner and a slave. And he discusses how a slave owner and a slave, who are both Christians now, should act with each other. And that relationship should be a tender-hearted relationship. How does that work? What about the injustices of slavery in those relationships? What about those injustices? What about the injustice of abuse in relationships? Are you telling me that I'm supposed to be submissive? That I'm supposed to be tender-hearted towards somebody who's abusing me? What about the injustice of social classism in those relationships? How can we view such injustices, such unjust things, as part of God's idea of a family? Well, see, here's the thing. We're working in a fallen system to restore it. Now, last sermon, what I talked about was that the family is a God-given institution, not unlike a NICU, a neonatal intensive care unit. It's a spiritual NICU to grow people until they are ready to face the world. Now, as the child grows into a functional member, they have to be introduced to the world which they needed protection from in the first place. So slowly and carefully, they have to be introduced, yes, but they do have to be introduced nonetheless. And operating in the world but not being of it is how we are supposed to operate as Christians. In the world but not of the world. Well, this means being able to accost men's sinful versions of God's systems and learn how to translate them back into God's purposes or allow them to be burned away by God's righteousness. Slavery, abuse, classism, and, I mean, any other just crazy, immoral types of actions, they're a fact of a fallen world. You don't hear Jesus addressing abortion. Does that mean that Jesus approved of abortion? No. Of course. Of course Jesus didn't approve of abortion. Jesus is the creator of all life. He is the one who gives people life. So, of course, he doesn't approve of abortion. That said, you don't see him addressing it. But what do you see? You do see his followers addressing it. Because there is an outworking of the right mindset. There are many evidences of how Christians with a loving mentality can undo men with a sinful one. There are many instances of how Christians, when they have a loving mentality, can undo the work of men who have a sinful one. Let's just take one. We'll take one that stands out. And his wasn't even purpose, purposeful. There was a guy whose name was Cyrus McCormick. I want you to consider him. He was an American Christian inventor who with the aid of his family and the willing help of his family's slaves built 
a mechanical reaper. What is a mechanical reaper? It makes harvesting easier, is what it is. It makes it so that you can, you can uh, harvest grain easier so people don't have to be in the fields anymore. It, he made it easier, and therefore it was cost ineffective to own slaves. He wanted a simple goal, which was to feed the world. Why did he want that? Because he was a Christian, and he believed that this was his responsibility. It was his ministry. So together with his house, including his slaves, this is in America in the late 1800s, he developed a machine to do this. Now, the book, The Major World, the book The Major World is the, is the title of it. <laughs> the book The Major World by Vijnal Mangawati um, explains it this way. Love is not a common ethical principle of all religions. Because in order to be spiritual, the learned pundits had to separate themselves from the peasants not, and not serve them. The hallmark of Indian spirituality, with a name like Vijnal Mangawati, you should know that he's Indian. Um, the hallmark of Indian spirituality was detachment from worldly pursuits like agriculture. Therefore, the spiritually advanced in my, his country, would treat the toiling masses as untouchable. McCormick's Reaper reinforces the point made in an earlier chapter that necessity is not the mother of all invention. All agricultural societies have needed to harvest grain, but no other culture invented the Reaper. Most cultures met this need by forcing into back-breaking labor those who were too weak to say no. Landless, laborers, servants, slaves, women, and children. But McCormick, he struggled to find a better way. Cyrus's family owned slaves, as did many others of their time. They were products of their era and could have purchased more human labor to bring in more harvests. But one difference the Bible made was that it demanded that McCormick work just as hard as any of his slaves. So we know that by the age of 15, Cyrus had despaired of seeing people slave in the fields. And that's when he resolved to build upon his father's failed attempts to find a better method for harvesting grain. So a Christian's want to feed the world and the belief that he should work hard and love his fellow man created enough camaraderie, even amongst his slaves, to help end slavery through innovation. This is not an isolated thing either. The UN's Declaration of Human Rights, for instance, it was opposed by Muslims because it rejected Sharia law. It viewed humans as made in the image of God, whether it expressly stated that or not. In fact, it was even called by atheist uh, Jürgen Habermas, the individual morality of conscience, human rights, and democracy is the direct legacy of the Judaic ethic of justice and the Christian ethic of love. This is an atheist who is saying that the UN has instituted these ideas about how we should treat humankind because of a Judeo-Christian worldview. The UN rights of colony slaves, they were developed by a disciple of Thomas Aquinas, a, a, a hugely influential Christian thinker. Modern social work, pioneered by Jane Addams. She was the first female American winner of the Nobel Peace Prize. She was a Christian. The London Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children, pioneered by Reverend Lord Shaftesbury. First ever UK law to protect children. He was a Christian. The Save the Children Relief Fund, Christian. Original Red Cross, Christian. American Red Cross, Christian. Action for Children, the first London orphanages. The founder, Thomas Bowman Stevenson, he was a Methodist minister. The English Factory Reform Bill that kept children out of working in the factories in England. 
de developed by Richard Osler. He was Christian. The age of consent. Yeah, that, that had to come into play at some point. The age of consent. So that children couldn't be taken advantage of. Pioneered by a Christian. The Magna Carta informed the Bill of Rights that we have, the Constitution. Christian. MLK. Social work. Social injustices. All of that. Christian. The Quakers reformed the prison system. Braille was developed by Louis Braille, a Christian. Low-cost health care from Christians. International fair trade from Christians. Habitat for Humanity from Christians. Salvation Army from Christians. Public libraries from Christians. YMCA from Christians. World Vision from Christians. 100 of the 110 universities in the U.S. founded by Christians. All because there's an idea of how we are supposed to interact in Christianity. How we are supposed to love each other in Christianity. Love covers a multitude of sins, according to 1 Peter 4.8. He says, above all, keep fervent in your love for one another. Keep it boiling. Keep it happening. Keep moving on it. Because love covers a multitude of sins. Yet, we as humans do not allow our love to cover a multitude of sins, especially when it comes to our families. Here in this one seminal area of our lives, we regularly make allowances for corruption. And we do this by laughing about it. We do this by making jokes that secretly hold ideologies that are unhealthy and unrighteous. We hide our sins with our humor. We make statements like, marriage equals death. In fact, today, not today, in fact, last week at this DCE, um, uh, what is that called? Cluster that I was at, a guy was getting married. And all of the men were telling him that his life is now over. I, of course, did not partake in that. Marriage equals death. It doesn't. Marriage equals a chance for holiness. Sin equals death. That's what equals death. If you bring sin into your marriage, then your marriage will die. Children equal death. Once it's, over, you're, it's done, now that you're a parent, they equal hardships, not according to Scripture. According to Scripture, they do, it doesn't equal death, it equals joy. Siblings should fight. Siblings should not fight. They do fight, but they shouldn't fight, and we shouldn't support that. Harsh language and name-calling in a family is just being funny. It's not being so serious. Uh, that's not biblical. All language, according to the scripture, is to be productive. Teasing people only makes them stronger. Not according to statistics. According to statistics, it doesn't. It drives resentment and creates insecurity. Men are stupid and lazy. Not true. Men can be stupid and lazy. That's absolutely true. But they are built to be a picture of who God is. Women are emotional and crazy. Well, that one is true. I'm just joking. See? There you go. It isn't true. In fact, I'm just going to read what I wrote. You try thinking faster than men while having more equipment to connect emotionally with everyone. That sounds overwhelming and diffi difficult. Difficult. Calling them emotional and crazy is vastly unfair and an oversimplification of a gift that they have. It's a burden that they carry. Children are too young to understand anything. Not true either. Children are sponges, according to everything we know. They are incredibly perceptive, even latently so. They suffer the children not to come to me. 
is what Jesus says. In other words, let them come to me. That's okay. Boys will be boys. A.K.A. boys will be immature. Boys will be ungentle. Not true. In that masculinity and testosterone is not synonymous with a lack of self-control. Nor is it synonymous with a lack of gentility, for the record. Young people break the rules. Also not true. Young people test boundaries. That is true. Young people test boundaries in order for them to understand their safety. Young people who break the rules generally have parents who, do, who don't enforce them. Young people are sexually promiscuous. That's just part of their nature. Not true. Young people are sexually charged. That is true. But that is not synonymous with having no self-control. We are not animals. We don't go around and hump whatever we want to. Everything that a child does is cute. And therefore appropriate. Also not true. There are many things that a child does that are very inappropriate. And personally speaking, completely not cute. We shouldn't correct a child because they'll grow up to hate us. That's what Dr. Spock, not Star Trek Spock, but Dr. Spock taught. Not true. In fact, studies show that children thrive under structure. Children without structure grow to resent their parents. Children with parents who allow consequences to come to bear grow to appreciate their parents. How about the statement that we make, I don't want to be the bad guy. I don't want to be the one to, to throw direction someone's way. False. Allowing consequences does not have morality attached to it, but not enforcing consequences does. You are the bad guy when you don't enforce consequences. Because, as the scriptures say, God disciplines those he loves. No one can tell me how to parent my children. Not true. Parenting informs society, and society therefore deserves input. Even in Jewish culture, the elders would deal out corporal punishments to the family members when the crime was large enough. It's all connected. The nuclear family before anything else. Not true. The nuclear family, as I've demonstrated, is only one part of God's design for the whole family. My children should have everything that I didn't have. Not true. The grass is always greener on the other side. What your children should have is contentment. They should learn to be content no matter what they have. I don't tell my children what I think because I don't want to inform their choices. I want them to come to conclusions on their own. False. I tell my children what I know in order to equip them to make the best decision possible. The scripture says that when we wake, when we walk, when we talk, we teach the instructions of the Lord. As our families are the starting place for how we should interact with all things, our families should be righteous in their interaction, first following the golden rule and then producing the fruit of the Spirit in our interactions. And this is a process which is open to the whole of God's community, not just the nuclear family, but the whole of God's community. In our interactions with each other, we are to take on the nature of God, the heart of God, the attitude of God, that we are to walk on his path. We are to wear his clothing. Jacqueline, can you put up the, the slide from this week? Is this one going to take a long time? Okay. Nope. It's the one I sent you from this week. There you go. Oh, you can't read that, but okay. <clears throat> so, basically, the way that this works is like this. 
you start off at a community. Right now, as we have all these children in our church, right, we are the covenantal community. We have a covenant relationship with the people in our church, with the kids in our church, to act a certain way because we are Christians first. And so you start with the community you are. We are the covenantal community. You may be the biological community, a nuclear family. You may be a friend in the relational community. But the first thing you do is you act toward the fruit of the Spirit. You display the fruit of the Spirit. You don't know what that is? It's essentially the nature of God. You can find it in Galatians 5, 22 through 23. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, goodness, self-control. This is the fruit of the Spirit. This is the outcome, the fruit, the, the product of what it is when the Spirit moves in you. So you take the fruit of the Spirit and you direct it toward the child. When you direct it toward the child, then the child begins producing the same thing. And the child produces it and puts it back into the community. And then it just goes over and over and over and over again. I'll make this so you can read it. I'll make it available on um, the, the messenger thread. But we're to put on the nature of God. In Galatians, we find the fruit of the Spirit. We're to have the heart of God, pure, peaceable. I can't read it. <laughs> Could be submissive, full of mercy and good works, and so on and so forth. We're supposed to have the attitude of God to be kind and tender-hearted and forgiving. We're supposed to walk the path of God, to be faithful and to be hopeful and to be loving. We're supposed to have the equipment of God, the clothing of God, the armor of God. If you look around the room, what do you see? Let's look over here. What do you see right here? Righteousness, the chest plate of righteousness. Over here, we have the helmet of salvation. You know what these things represent, right? They represent the areas of your body that are targeted by the devil. By the world. The head is a place where our mentality comes from. And when somebody's going to get us down, whether it be the world, whether it be the devil, they're going to take out the head if they can. That's what's going to kill you. What do you have to do? You have to step beyond where you are coming from, and you have to put faith in the mentality of God. It's not what I do, but it's God who follows through. According to Scripture, that faith that you have protects your head. It's a helmet, a helmet of salvation. If you want a weapon, it's going to be the truth. You want to be able to fight back? You fight back with the truth. When Jesus was being tempted by Satan, he didn't go on long expositions about, you know, why Satan is this or why Satan is that. No, he simply quoted scripture to Satan because that is the revelation of God. That is the truth. Your heart, your lungs, all of these things that keep your body functioning, they're protected by a chest plate or a breastplate, if you will. The breastplate of righteousness. If you are righteous, if you do what you're supposed to, if you keep your actions clean and holy, then these vital organs that you have will not be exposed. And so on and so forth. There's your little lesson in that. I will make this more available to you. It also has the scriptures attached to it so you can see. But that's how we're supposed to act. In this vein, when we act with the fruit of the Spirit toward each other, we produce all of these things in each other which then perpetuates and then produces. We, all of us, are keepers of the family and its parts. Not simply the nuclear family is the keeper of the family. Not simply the friends. A lot of people have replaced their nuclear family with their friends. Not simply the church. My family is not my biological any anymore. I've moved beyond them. Now it's the church. Some of you may be concerned about that, especially when you have a church that's strong like we are. And then you have people coming to our church and you're like, I'm worried about my family like leaving me behind. If I have anything to say about it, that will not happen. We are all in it together. You do not trade one out for the other. You bring everyone in it together before God. 
That's how it's supposed to work. In this way, we're all partners in God's family. We all are to have the same method, with God at the top, through the Biofather, or Christ. We all are to, same, to have the same goal, through an accurate reflection of the image of God, and therefore the same outcome, which is an accurate reflection of the image of God, and then replication of that image. There are tools to help us with this. We need to communicate. We need to submit to God. We need to genuinely love each other. We need to operate within God's systems. Does this ensure success? No. It doesn't. When I say that, maybe I should say it this way. Does this ensure smooth sailing? How about that? No. No. Anybody who tells you that if you're a Christian and you put your faith in God, then, you're gonna, then your relationships are going to be amazing and you're going to get a, a Cadillac and $1,000 every week and you just need to will it into existence, hasn't read the Bible. The truth is, is that conflict will arise. Why does conflict arise? Well, because we're dynamic. That's why. Because we're not static. Because as much as we learn the other person, we have to keep learning them. And to keep learning them, we have to keep learning ourselves. It takes effort. So will conflicts arise? Yes, but as demonstrated, fervent love for each other covers a multitude of sins. As demonstrated, that long list, that example of McCormick, all of that covers a multitude of sins. So yes, conflicts will arise, but fervent love can cover those sins and even undo them. Our responsibility in this is to change our way of interacting with each other and God. And that means that we must repent. That's a big word. Repent. You've heard that word before, I'm sure. What does it mean? What does it mean to repent? Repentance has two components attached to it. The first one is that we must turn a complete 180 degrees and start moving in the opposite direction. It's not 360 because then you would be right back where you are. <laughs> it's 180. You're turning completely around and walking in the opposite direction from the direction you're going. That's the first component to repentance. The second component is that we must let this movement be fueled by a deep understanding that our original direction was wrong. Our original direction was wrong and in need of correction. We must believe that it is morally correct to change our ways. That's what I mean when I say that we must repent. So much of our worship music has no concept of repentance in it. So much of what the church teaches nowadays has nothing to do with repentance. But contrition before God, repentance before God, is a hugely important and vital aspect of worship and of making relationships work. We cannot be afraid of that word because it calls us to action. Holiness starts in the family. So, if you hate your brother or sister, if you cannot stand to be around them, I implore you to repent. To submit to God, restore your genuine love, communicate, and support each other. If you hate your spouse, it can be in the heart. There's a lot of people who stay together just for the kids. I should have put that one in my list earlier. It can be in the heart. If you hate your spouse, if you treat them as one of two equals, 
rather than a part of who you are, as the scriptures say, to become one. If you are unable to be removed, rather, if you don't want to be removed, if you hate your spouse, I call you to repent. Submit to God. Restore your genuine love for them. Communicate with them and become one. If you have hated God's larger system in favor of your little nuclear family, if you have been angry with your Christian brother or sister for speaking into your marriage or your parenting, for seeking to share your burdens with you, I call you to repent. Submit to God's system to restore genuine love for God's plan for society, to forgive anybody who may have done this in the wrong way but for the right reason, to reopen the doors of communication. If you have hated your child for the toll that they have taken on your life, for the way that they have used your resources, for the lack of thanks that you get as their mother or their father, for the lack of return that you will see. I call you to repent. If you have withheld your support for your brother or sister or father or mother, if you have kept silent as you saw their suffering or even their joy, if you have said to the Almighty God, it's not my problem, I am not my brother's keeper, What am I referring to there? Cain and Abel. Right? God says, where's your brother? Cain says, I'm not my brother's keeper. I call you to repent. This is all of our responsibility to interact correctly with each other. To produce righteousness. Is this going to be easy? No. Are people going to immediately connect to it? Possibly not. Is somebody never, ever going to do right by it? Like you put this out there and you say, I need to make this right. They may turn around and they may say to you, no, I am not going to make this right with you. Does that mean that we don't do it? No. Because we have a responsibility before God. Holiness starts in the family. In situations like that, you need to keep yourself from accessing those demonic types of wisdom. Do not be bitter with those people. Do not be seeking your own self with those people. Do not do things that create discord with those people. Do not envy what those people have. Instead, Try to remain tender-hearted toward them. Try to keep the door of relationship open for them, even when they don't want it or won't accept it or you may never see it. And we have a tendency to do that with our friends, our relational community. We have a tendency to do that with our churches, our covenantal community. But for some reason, we have a hard time doing that inside of our biological communities. If you are having a hard time with that, it starts with you. Repent. Let's turn the ship together. Next week, we're going to talk more about what makes a godly family unique. But this week, I want to ask you these questions. Have you allowed all of the communities in your family to create the type of family that you're supposed to have? What I mean by that is sometimes we don't come with the skills in our biological community 
for holiness. Sometimes we need input. Have you allowed that input? Have you put yourself out there for other people who may need your insight? Or did you say, I'm not my brother's keeper? Do you have harmful ideologies, jokes, and assumptions about family that you are in need of repentance of? Have you ever thought to yourself, yeah, I probably shouldn't make this joke anymore. And I probably shouldn't be thinking this thought anymore. That was the immature me. It's time to put that away. Do you have things that you need to put away? What is the weakest relationship in your family? And are you willing to do what is necessary to make it strong? Please go and discuss. Happy Mother's Day.